Hi there, this is James Chai, RFR Park, Park Park Rescue Foundation, vid dog training. And I apologize for starting up a bit late today. Just um, having some technical difficulties, as you can well imagine, uh, on a Monday. And I'm going to have to replace my, or, or return that camera that I just bought over the weekend, or, or should I say on Friday, that I finally got from Amazon. They shipped it to me loosely packed. Because it said the box was damaged, so it'll be repackaged. So it, sh it was it was shipped to me, loosely packed. A camera, a little brand new camera, loosely packed and wrapped in plastic, and uh, the lens was left open. And so I spent a bunch of time with Amazon customer service, and they said, "Well, too bad. There's nothing we can do about it. You can return it." And I went, "Wow, that's that's great service." I said, "What about you know?" Anyways. So uh, I'm going to get a new, uh, I'm going to order a different camera and hopefully I'll be able to get that going. Um, but today I'm going to talk about uh, something that I experienced over the weekend working with a family and that is regards to Alpha. And a lot of people have probably heard of Alpha before is where you are working with um, your dog, anyone's dog. And one thing is, you know, if, if it's yourself, your family, you at home, and you're looking at stuff online, and you're reading it, and you're watching videos, and you think to yourself, okay, this is kind of maybe something I might have to help with my dog because my dog's not listening to me anymore, my dysfunctional dog, so I'm going to be a little bit more brutal with him, uh, physically brutal, and again, that's alpha, and alpha is that aspect of dominating, essentially dominating a dog, and that aspect probably comes from the fact that when somebody used force with a dog, they saw that it worked and the dog became compliant. And then they cause a comparison on a somewhat loosely scientific uh, relational perspective of, oh, well, well, we see what happens in wolf packs, for example, because wolf packs are the most famous. We see wolf packs where the male and female, uh, as they call it, alpha pair, are dominating the rest of the family by keeping everyone else in line, the family pack of all the other wolves. And as I've said beforehand, uh, I don't believe in the alpha pack as per se when it comes to uh, canines, wolves, etc. I believe more so than anything else, the alpha mom, the alpha dad, mom and dad, alpha male, uh, alpha female, alpha male is mom and dad. They're the parenting of the family. There's a familial structure to the wolf pack itself, and this happens uh, by by um, extrapolation, by extension to canines that are living at home, dogs, domesticated dog genus, where the dog themselves learns to be part of our family. And that is a familial aspect, and I always call that as the fact that dogs, domesticated dogs, are an overt spe uh, 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 strain of the species, right? A genus, G-E-N-U-S, is a strain, uh, uh, you know, of the species. So that canines, dogs, domesticated dogs, are overt codependent, humans are covert codependent so dogs are showing how much they love us and they love being part of a family and we humans are kind of a bit reserved and we don't want to show any public displays of affection but if you think about it when it comes to our domesticated dogs if they weren't domesticated if they were living in the wild how would they be they'd be quite feral they would be somewhat similar to what we see as wolves and other canines out in that uh, wild wild uh, world of uh, wild animals. What I'm basically saying is the domesticated dog still shares a lot of traits with their canine cousins and they can not necessarily revert is what I don't want to call it, but they will get to that part of their brain uh, structure where our dogs will then begin to survive in the wild and they will start to forge and they'll start to scrounge and they will start to find affinities with other wolves i mean sorry other dogs in the in the wild if not then they're somewhat unable to maintain a social structure and then they may end up fighting trying to be part they and but you notice that dogs always try to belong to each other you see the wild dogs the stray dogs they are you know you see the videos where people are feeding the stray dogs in other countries and even locally and the dogs come out and they tend to live and, and circulate and socialize in groups and they'll eat around each other in those groups. So it's a familial aspect. There's no dominant behavior that's going on in there as per se. It's, it's really just them hanging out, even though there's not a lot of information on the wild footage. Sorry, I just got to turn this off here. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, video on the wild uh, 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 do-abouts of, um, of a... Uh, 
uh, of a stray dog. So I'm just want to make sure that I don't go over my post here today. Um, but yeah, so we're not going to see the domesticated dog in the wild acting, you know, covert uh, or overt and codependence. But when they start to find the little group, they're going to hang out and they're going to be happy with each other. They're going to be somewhat loosely safe as they uh, maintain their 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 protection in numbers. And there's going to be some sort of behavior that is, yes, got to create a structure for sure. We've got to create that family structure in it. And we're not going to see that when we come to our home, into our home with the dog. Sorry, I'm just going to put this down here just before I keep getting distracted. I just want to make sure that I'm getting comments as well because um, I'm doing this off of my computer and unfortunately it's not showing stuff. Uh, I do hope that I will be able to get podcasting by the beginning of December and then things will be a lot better and then I'll be doing live broadcasts uh, a bit fewer so it is okay good all right I wasn't getting it showing that it was showing on my 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 Facebook so it's it would suck if I didn't have that okay all right so we're going to go with that part and hopefully if we have any comments comments will come up and then I can see them okay that, oops let me turn that off but yeah so so when it comes to alpha aspect of it I don't follow that belief in, in regards to alpha and I don't think it's a, a necessity. And I know I kind of strayed off there a little bit and I apologize. I don't believe in the alpha aspect when it comes to creating a structure within our home with our dogs, especially a familial structure. This is what it is. Our dogs are, our domesticated dogs are living with us. They're living on the couch, they're living on the floor, on the bed, but, but they're living inside with us. They're domesticated. They live with us. And, and how do they live with us? They live uh, with us as part of our family. If you have, if you're by yourself or you have four or five kids and you're married and you have your in-laws living with you, it's still part of a family. Everyone in that family in that household of yours has a structure of course but there's no alpha that's going on with you and your wife or husband there's no alpha going on with you and your children there's parenting and there's there is spousal support and partnering that's going on with your partner uh, it doesn't matter what kind of couple you are if you're straight or not straight gay whatever it doesn't matter there's still parenting that goes on and when you're taking care of your children you love your children you're not dominating them so why should there be a shift in the, the fact that you're taking care of your children in a parental, loving, firm manner with your dogs who, who are similar to children, as the scientists say, two to three-year-old mentality and emotional sophistication. So why would we treat our dogs in a different manner? Why would we treat our dogs in a different format than we would our own children if we ourselves feel that emotional context with our dogs for those of us who believe dogs have feelings and all that i absolutely 100 percent do i uh, i know dogs are amazing they would give their life to defend ours without even thinking when we're truly in trouble our dogs will come up and see what's wrong if we fell and hurt ourselves if we're truly being threatened our dogs will immediately come out and defend us well majority of them unless they're completely scared but the majority of our dogs in our homes and there's almost 100 million dogs in north america living in about 64 million homes domesticated homes in north america there's between 900 million to 1 billion dogs living globally that's including stray dogs that's a rough estimate nobody knows for sure there's a few uh, i just googled all the stuff here right for the stats and the road organization blah blah i don't know anyways i just did a bunch of the stuff here i wasn't really paying too much attention to it in the sense of where exactly um all the dogs were living but of course there's a lot of stray dogs 900 million to a billion makes unfortunate sense there's that many if we're looking at how many uh factory farmed animals we go through globally well for for those of you who eat meat you see there are billions i think there's like six billion chickens that are uh you know are are are, are, are go through it annually uh consumed annually there is uh i think um 60 or 70 billion land animals that are consumed annually uh, in our in our world, which is just a that's ten to one animals per human. Um, let me just see. Oh, good, I have comments now. Hey, Mary, my dogs did pretty good while I was caring for her. They were upset after her passing. I think they knew I was upset, and they were reacting because of me. Um, you know, Mary. Uh, Mary had posted in regards to her mom uh, that was coming to live with her uh, through hospice, 
and then the process through for uh, her mom's passing at home versus a hospital, which is an amazing opportunity, uh, chance and experience uh, to have that happen versus, you know, uh, at the hospital. Um, but, you know, my condolences to you, Mary. And uh, yeah, wow. Um, it's never good to lose, obviously, anyone, human or animal. I've, you know, both my parents are gone, and uh, obviously the, my beloved dogs as well um, in my life have, have uh, moved onward to wherever else the universe is going to, uh, to take us all. So nobody, nobody knows. But um, again, just getting back to the domesticated dog and the way that they live with us and the alpha aspect of it, um, I know that's something that does go on. And this weekend I was with a couple a family and with their in-laws and, and really, really cool couple. And they have a dog that is a Formosan uh, mountain dog. And I'm um, oh, sorry, uh, Jindo. I'm sorry, Jindo. Uh, Jindo, it's like Minky, actually, similar to Minky, a little bit smaller, not as um, as difficult as uh, Minky's life was. But there's evidence on, uh, on this dog's face. Um, his name's Tony on his face where he's been hit in the face uh, and scarred. And you can see the fur um, uh, uh, where it's some of it scarred there. So unfortunately that happens and it's really heartbreaking for sure. Um, and it's heartbreaking to see that in person because then you can see where, you know, obviously if you see someone who's been beaten and a human being has been beaten and they have scars, you got to know they went through some psychological trauma besides the physical trauma. And, um, you know, it's tough as well for dogs. Um, you know, I believe in equal rights, absolutely human rights for everybody. And those of you who have been following me for the last few years know that I have a human rights complaint against the city of Vancouver for discrimination against people with disabilities who have and need dogs for service use, right? Emotional support dogs. I have a, a petition with 105,000 plus signatures that um, uh, Member of Parliament Honorable Ken Hardy will be presenting to the House of Commons now that the Liberals are re-elected regards to criminalizing dog and cat meat. I used to have a retail store, um, uh, a clothing store, a shoe store that would, um, um, you know, that we catered to every everyone uh, marginalized or not and supported a, a, um, a community a charity, a loving, a loving spoonful which helps people with HIV and AIDS as well. So that's what I did, you know, I, I just believe that we should kind of have a bit more enlightenment about each other and a bit more generosity and compassion and understanding and equality, regardless um, of who and where and what you want to do with your life, as long as it's not criminal, but we want to make sure that we have that kind of compassion and everything. So when it comes to our dogs and the alpha aspect of it, it's really kind of difficult to to connect the two when on one part we're being really happy with our dogs, I mean, with our humans, and we're having this great connection with somebody that we love. And then at the same time, we have someone who then can be quite uh, physically brutal to their dog. And and I guess when I say physically brutal, I'm not I'm not saying like that the person is beating, um, you know, alpha as per se as, as beating people, but it's more so the fact of, you know, forcing your dog on the ground. And if, if you're a private citizen, you know, you have a dog and you sometimes get a little bit frustrated and all that, it's, it's understandable, right? I mean, we're cross species, cross cohabitation. We're trying uh, cross, yeah, cohabitation. We're trying to live uh, with another species and, and, you know, their, their first reaction, a dog's first reaction that's dysfunctional is to uh, defend themselves either defensively or, or offensively. And, you know, the, the, our dogs will react, right? I have dogs here that, that you know, you, if I push them um, when they first got here, then they would have brutally uh, um, uh, injured me. But it's understanding that we have, to look at the emotional context of our dogs. And if we try to help a dog that's been beaten or that a dog is extremely skittish from the meat dog farms or from, you know, being astray once having been domesticated then being abandoned and thrown off and that dog has to learn to live on their own. Like I was talking about the primal aspects of their, their natural survival instincts. Um, you can imagine that uh, for a dog that's through that type of trauma, just like a, if we were to kick a kid out of the home, 
out of our home and they lived on the streets for a few years, getting them to come back into a domesticated environment, getting that person that we've kicked out into a, uh, uh, a, a domesticated, you know, just to, to trust us is going to be next to impossible because we betrayed that trust. We have said, well, you don't belong, et cetera. Um, when it comes to the alpha part, if the dog is coming from a really difficult situation, difficult life, it's, it's scared of getting beaten or scared of getting hurt or scared of the outdoors, whatever it is, the, our dog, the dog is going to look to us for trust because we're, we're forcing them to live in our home and they're scared. The last thing we want to do is do alpha to them. The last thing we want to do is create an oppressive physical correction on a dog that's scared anybody anybody at all you know we we know all about these abusive relationships with human beings and it, you know usually it's the men on the women and so if a woman is subjected to spousal abuse right intimidation oppression physical force not only would most women say you know what i'm done we're out of this i'm out of this relationship don't ever call me again or else the the guy would be in jail right? You'd have charges laid against them and all that stuff would happen. And all these things are, are, are real. It happens. People lose their minds and all that stuff. They get upset. There's nothing wrong. We're all predators, animals to begin with. But doing that kind of behavior, uh, if we put that into scale to our dogs, is a really horrible thing because our dogs are already victimized when they come to us, right? If, for those of you who adopt rescue dogs that might have a questionable past that might have been abused. And, and there's a lot of people out there who will adopt a dog that has some abuse or some sort of difficult past because we want them to feel better. We have to realize that when they come to us, if we can't figure out why they're scared of us, if we can't figure out why that they're reactive or they're afraid, the last thing we want to do is use force to force compliance, I guess. I mean, I, I, I don't know what to say about it. I mean, this, 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 this family, they had gone through a couple of trainers. Um, one of them, one of them I'm kind of familiar with the other one. I'm unfortunately very familiar with. Um, but the, the first one would tell the, the family to give treats and treats and, and all that stuff. And of course you're wondering, well, why doesn't it work anymore? Cause let's face it. Food doesn't exist as a communication tool anywhere in the canine species. Food is something that dogs fight over. Wolves will fight to the death over. So it's, it's just, it was just tough to see because it was such a beautiful, uh, uh, Tony, such a beautiful dog. And he, he wanted so much to trust his family. He wanted so much for his family. Tony wanted his family to understand him. And his family tried. His family worked hard. They went to different trainers, right? In the treat training part. Again, you know, if you have a dysfunction, if you're traumatized over something, the last thing that's going to help you is food, right? Comfort food. Maybe it'll help a little bit and you're done, but it's not going to help you get over the trauma. And then the next uh, trainer, um, uh, uh, there, uh, uh, these two guys. Um, just, I, I don't understand these uh, these guys, um, these dudes. They have uh, they have been doing this for for a number of years. Is this alpha part? And it's why? Why do you need to be so physically oppressive to a dog? Why do you have to force a dog into compliance by making them scared of you? That's what alpha is. As a, as a professional, you shouldn't have to do that. You shouldn't have to intimidate your dog to make compliance happen on a daily basis. They're not really doing anything. Dogs aren't really doing anything other than wanting to be part of the family. They want to be loved. They want to love back. And if they don't, if they don't comply, if they don't, follow your orders is not because they need to be dominated and, and shoved to the ground. It's because they don't understand what you're asking them. I talk about, hi, Sammy. I t I'm going to get Sammy. Sammy, uh, you know, I talk about, oh, here, Sammy. Come, Sammy. She can, she, here's Sammy. Sammy wants to go. Hi, Sammy. Hi, Sammy. This is Sammy. Hello, Sammy. Hi, Sammy. Hi, Sammy. This is Sammy. Okay, Sammy. Hi, Sammy. 
Sammy's going to fall asleep, I think, as she scratches my neck. Hello, baby Sammy. Um, yeah, so uh, you, there, there's there's really no need to to do the alpha. So um, these these guys, these dudes are um, are unable to understand what's going on. Let's face it. When you resort to physical, when when a person resorts to physical uh, uh, correction in a, in a brutal manner. It shows you don't know what you're talking about. If you're trying, you know, if you're a trainer and you're teaching people to get a dysfunctional dog that's scared to do something, it ain't gonna work if you're hurting your dog or, or their dog. You know, the, the customer, the the family comes to you and says, Hey, my dog is scared, my dog is traumatized, my dog's reactive, my dog's dysfunctional. I need you to help my dog. The last thing. The last thing to help a dysfunctional dog, the dog that hurts, is to, to, to scare them, to force them into compliance. It's a horrible feeling. And these guys have made a, a business off of it. And I think actually they probably they even have some sort of little uh, show on, uh, on Amazon Prime. And, you know... It's it's pretty sad um, to to live on a. Uh, I'm trying to be tactful without being too um, too rude uh, uh, about this, even though it just disgusts me. If you're a professional, you should be able to tell intuitively or through intermediate bridging or whatever these little names that uh, y'all rely on. You should be able to intuitively see what's wrong with a person's dog, your client's dog, and go, okay, here's the situation. This is what's wrong with the dog. We don't need to alpha the dog because it'll just make a scared dog more scared. We need to understand and we need to show our scared dog that we understand what's wrong. You're going to get way more with honey than you will get with vinegar. You will get way more with love than you'll get with brutality. I say to people... Uh, say you're working with a, a small business, you, you know, you're an employee, small business, and I've been there myself, you know, employee, small business, a couple of employees maybe. And, you know, if the boss asks me to stay late and say, you know, I can't really afford to stay, I can't really afford to pay an extra hour or two or whatever, right? It's just, you know, a small little startup, whatever. Um, would you mind just staying an extra hour or so and, and you know, would that would you be and if i like the boss and and the owner i mean the owner the boss and the, uh, the owner's nice and and i do know that they're being sincere and all that i'll be like yeah okay i can you know i'll hang out for another hour and, and work for free but if it's somebody that you don't like or don't respect because they take advantage of you or they uh, dominate you then you're gonna say no you're gonna say no i'm not i can't help i, I have to go home and you know something make up an excuse but you're not going to want to help because you understand the 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 dominant part the alpha part of this person you you understand that they don't uh, recognize you in 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 sincerity and uh in genuinity um mary says uh, i feel that i'm alpha but it's not being scared but respect well see mary it's not about being alpha it's about being a parent we can be parents to our children, to children. We can be alpha. We can be in control, absolutely, but it's how we do it. Parents are alpha, right? We talk about the alpha male, alpha female, wolf pack. It's essentially still the same part of it. It's how we exercise. It's how we utilize our position as top of the parenting chain, uh, top of the family chain. If our kid, if we have a kid, our child and, and we just, you know, we made dinner and, and now we've cleaned everything up and the stove is still warm or, or still hot and our child is, you know, three-year-old child's walking around near the stove and he touches the stove or turns on the, turns on the knobs again, right? What are we going to say? Okay, stop it. And then we're going to tell him again and he goes and plays it again and we tell him to stop. We're not going to grab him after he does it the fourth or fifth time and start beating him and force him to the ground. We're not going to grab our child and push him to the ground and say, stop touching the stove. 
we're going to spend some time and explain to our child, you can't be touching the stove because it's hot and you will get burned and it will hurt a lot. You're not going to scream at the child. You're not going to say, okay, you want to see how hot the stove is? I'm going to put your hand on the stove. That's just parenting. You just, hey, you know what? It's not safe and I don't want you to do it. And you're going to maintain vigilance. And most parents are going to be like that. They're going to be, all right, uh, honey, get away from the stove or you're going to get burnt. You're not going to be screaming. You're not going to be forcing the child down. I just, I, I just, I just have to, I just don't understand this part when it comes to the professionals that are out there, like these dudes who are who are doing stuff like that. And then people are like, oh my gosh, they're, they have a, their own show on Amazon or, oh my gosh, they're, they're well recognized and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, these dudes are brutalizing your dog. And because they have a, a reputation then it's like, oh, yeah, we got to listen to these people because they know what they're talking about. But they're wrong. Um, you know, I've got my, my, my stuff, media and, and newspapers and articles and all stuff on me. But I, I, I'm grateful to be hired by people to help with their dogs. And when I see, when I see this happening, it's just brutal. It's, it's, it's gross. And then to see the results of the dog, uh, like Tony, um, in such a, a distraught dysfunction, it, it's tough. And then the other thing that these dudes did was, so they were afraid of Tony because what ended up happening is when you start to alpha a fearful dog or a reactive dog, what is the dog going to do? The dog is going to start to either one, shut down even more, or the dog will start to defend himself. So, so this family was told that they need to muzzle their dog. This is not something that is easy to do for, for most dogs that are dysfunctional. It's definitely not something that can be done easily with an ex, a skittish or an extremely skittish or a reactive dog. Because, of course, right off the bat, you're tr we're trying to put on this this device, this object that they've never seen before, that they have no idea what it is, and we're trying to put it on them. And so this family, um, you know, really nice couple, really nice couple. Uh, so the family was told to, you know, get a muzzle in the session they're going to have, uh, they're going to force uh, Tony to put on a muzzle. And all that did was freak Tony out even more got him even more and more scared, freaked him out, and Tony became nippy to his own parents. And he became a bit more dysfunctional and a bit more unpredictable because now he couldn't even trust his own parents to take care of him and to save him because they were one of the humans that were hurting him, that were threatening him. And this is based on, right? So if a trainer knows what they're talking about, then they're going to say, oh, okay, well, you know what? trying to put a muzzle on this dog already would be worse. It would make him really more scared and it'd make his situation worse. But the dudes don't see it because these dudes want to protect their reputation. And I mean, it's, it's fragile. It's, I mean, I, I saw these guys driving their SUV last summer in the carpool lane, right? And which is because they're, they're both in there and, um, they had a couple of dogs, and this is the summertime. They're driving an SUV. It's a nice SUV, and they have the windows open. And, and, and the traffic was doing probably about 60 kilometers on the highway, so which is about 40 miles. So the speed limit, they were because there's heavy traffic, and they have the windows open while they're driving their, I think it's probably like $70,000 SUV. Nothing wrong with having an SUV, right? I mean, hey, you know, I used to have SUVs myself. There's nothing wrong with having a nice vehicle. If you if you earned it, you deserve it, all right? I mean, I my previous business, I uh, was transporting high-value vehicles for very wealthy people. So, hey, you earned it, you get to deserve it. But these guys are driving like a $70,000 SUV on the highway during traffic in the summertime with dogs in the in their SUV with their windows rolled down. The five or 10 cents that they're going to save with the windows open doesn't do anything for the comfort of the dogs. And it shows 
that they don't really care about the dogs, that these dudes don't care. If the summer, I mean, it's freaking boiling hot. It's freaking boiling hot. And they got the windows open because they're too cheap to run the air conditioning for their dogs. And their clients' dogs start air in the back of the SUV. So the alpha just shows another part of the denigration of their perspective on dogs. They don't care. Like, honestly, if you're actually going to leave your windows open because you're too freaking cheap in the summertime while these dogs are wearing fur coats, you really don't care about the dogs. You only care about your reputation. You only care about the alpha. You only care about the brutality. And what's worse is that these dudes, and I'm calling them dudes, and then you figure out who they are. These dudes, while they're trying to help this family with the, the, the muzzle and trying to get the muzzle on, and of course, Tony's just not happy at all, right? And he's reactive, and he's trying to defend himself, and he's come freaked out, and he's nipping at his own humans for the first time. The dudes then tell this family that their dog Tony is one of the is the worst dog they've ever tried to get a muzzle on. That's a pretty disgusting statement. That they lack such skill or experience or or, or humility that they can't even recognize forcing a muzzle on to a, a scared dog. Is going to make the dog worse. And the family pays the price because the family's like, well, you know, I talked to the dudes did it and they have their TV show and blah, 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 and all that stuff. So they must be right. And my dog must just be broken. And when, when professionals say dumb things like your dog is the worst, or I've never seen a dog this bad, it shows that they don't know what they're talking about that these dudes don't know what they're doing and they're blaming an innocent dog for their ineptitude. You don't need to alpha a dog if you know what's wrong. Look at these salespeople who are wildly successful. Um, you know those guys who sell those multi-million dollar homes and those Salespeople who sell those hundreds and million dollar cars, which I've run into, right? Because when I was moving cars for these guys, these people are amazing. They don't alpha. They follow through with the flow and they listen. Even, even when I would come in as a truck driver ready to pick up a Lamborghini from, from one of the, the dealerships, they treated me in a, such a way that made me feel respected. And I'm coming in dressed like, oh, you know, in, in trucker clothing and all, you know, like jeans and, and all that stuff, while everyone else is walking around ten thousand, twenty thousand dollar suits, literally. But they they knew, regardless, how to treat somebody. And people who had bought cars that were their end user, the customers, they would talk about how these salespeople were, or, or salesmen, saleswomen, uh, were great and that they knew what they were talking about and they had different subjects to discuss and all that stuff. Long story short is they knew how to read each person. They knew how to convince someone to do something without forcing them. If they tried alpha in any kind of situation like that, they'd lose a half a million dollar sale. And, and the amount of money that they make on these cards, like if you knew how much some of these, these salespeople make, you would just poop your pants. It's, it's crazy money. But uh, what I'm saying is that they know what to do. They know how to work somebody if they need to, right? And we do it with our children. We use our reverse psychology. We, we do it with our friends. We, you know, we kind of, right? We talk about, we all, it's give and take. But we don't alpha. If someone tries to alpha me in a, in a friendship, I'd be like, yeah, I don't really want to talk to you anymore. Or I just don't talk to them anymore, right? I, I ignore them because I don't have respect because they don't have respect for me because they're trying to dominate the conversation. They're trying to force me to do something I don't want to do. And if I did that to somebody else, same thing. They'd be like, ah, you know what? Too pushy or doesn't understand. And then the customer, the, the, the client, the friend is going to say, yeah, just 
too much. The alpha part of it is, is just a really archaic method. It's just total brute force. Tony wasn't able to progress forward. And in fact, after going to the two trainers, uh, his family contacted his original rescue and they, they'd had him for uh, a year. And what's amazing about this family is like some people will go, oh, well, I'm going to return the dog now because it's, you know, instead they moved forward to find help. And so they contacted the rescue again, which they, they said they would regret not having done so originally because it would have saved them a lot of money. And then the rescue said to contact me because they work with me and, you know, which is great because they, they have their treat trainers, but they know when it comes to dysfunctions, then it's contact James. So they contacted me um, and I met them yesterday and worked with them. And just the stuff I heard. I was like, wow, no wonder Tony doesn't know what's going on. No wonder Tony's reactive. No wonder Tony's trying to lunge at cards. And no wonder Tony's upset. And no wonder Tony doesn't trust you guys. And no wonder Tony is skittish. No wonder Tony is going to be like this if you didn't have any understanding of what was going on. No wonder. If you don't know what the if, – if you're hiring professionals. You're paying – you know, if you're spending almost like $1,000 on trainers – you want the trainer to tell you what's going on. You don't want the trainer, the behaviorist like Ledger or whatever, to prescribe medication. You don't want them to, to alpha the dog. You don't want them to make speculative statements. Oh, well, I think your dog. No, just tell us what is wrong with our dog and how to address it. So we went out yesterday. Uh, I got there at about, uh, I think, 2 p.m. And, and because they had been through this is such a nice family and the, and the, the dad and the, the mom, the, the mother-in-law and father-in-law, um, such really cool people, just really cool, cool people. Uh, um, you know, just really cool. And, um, the dad is really cool just because he was really cool. Um, um, but you know, so, so started at two o'clock, and we went and walked around the neighborhood and, and it's always that, okay, where is most likely that your dog's going to be reactive, right? And usually whenever someone hires me, I say, okay, they say, well, do we come to your facility? And I say, no, I come to you because there's no use you coming to my neighborhood or, or the, where I, right? What's the use? If you're having issues with your dog, it's not about going, it's not about you bringing your dog to me. It's me going to where your dog is having issues, which is in your neighborhood. And, you know, I've heard other stories actually for a side here on a little bit of a tangent. Um, uh, I, I've heard these ones where these other trainers will have their, have a reactive dog class or advanced reactive dog class. I'm just like, advanced? What? Aren't they all just reactive and you just deal with it? So they have these little scales and they have these little certificates and everything. And I kind of, it's cute, right? It's like buying your child their little black belt karate certificate right it's cute because the dog doesn't care right the dog's like either i'm gonna react or i'm not gonna react what's this piece of paper you're giving me do i pee on it do i chew it up and so uh, in these reactive dog groups they have the dog off to the side oh let me oh i can't get that and that they have they have the dog off to the side they have the dog in you know uh, the other reactive dogs are here, and then they have the other dogs off to the side and everything like that. And it's like your reactive dog is not going to learn how to associate with other dogs if they're 100, me you know, 100 feet away, 200 feet away. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. You create more anxiety and distrust in your dog because you're avoiding the environment. And, and that's a different talk for a different time. Uh, and I and I want to be focused on this stuff. I'm pretty pretty happy with myself today so far. I'm still on focus, uh, relatively with the alpha side of things. A few little uh, little you know wiggles, but I'm still here. And Sammy is still awake. Hi, Sammy. Sammy, there's Sammy. Sammy's so cute. Um, so yeah. Um, so the alpha side of things is is so for this couple is that they were taught to alpha and they were told that their dog, uh, Tony was the worst dog they ever seen trying to get a muzzle on. And it's like, wow. I mean, I don't know how long the dudes guys have been working for like six years or something like that. 
because you're saying like like who who would even say that like who says that who goes up to you and says your dog's the worst dog i've ever worked with what are you gonna think when someone says that to you what do you think when a professional says that to you you're gonna feel like crap you're gonna feel like a failure and you're gonna feel like your dog is destined and doomed and especially when you have somebody who says that they're, they're, they're great and they have an Amazon Prime thing and all that stuff. Nothing wrong with that, but don't use the power arrogantly. What do you think the couple, anybody is going to say when you say to them, yeah, this and that, and this is who we are, and we're da, 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 uh, and your dog is an issue? Most people are going to feel despondent and sad, and they're either going to look around for another trainer who actually knows what they're talking about, who will use air conditioning. Um, <laughs> but a lot of people are going to say to themselves, there's no hope because this trainer has tried everything, including alpha, which is supposed to work, and the muzzling, which the dog won't put on, and the dog is a failure now. The humans, you, the owners, the parents are going to say, maybe this is not a good fit for, for, for the dog and us. When I get hired by people who need help, and it's always them finding out after looking around and being dissatisfied with their current trainers and all that is moving forward. And I always say to them, hey, you know what? If your current trainer wants to come and watch what I'm doing, they're more than happy to because I'll show them what they're doing wrong. Every single trainer said no. <laughs> Every single trainer is like, no, we don't want that James guy and all that stuff. It's like, wow, if you really want to learn how to work with a dog that you've been failing with, maybe your humility should come into play. You can come in and watch what James will do, what I'll do in, in less than an hour, which will take you like six sessions to still fumble through. And I say that because it just frustrates me because they would rather take your money. They would rather these professionals who don't know what they're doing and I'm a professional, and I may not sound great for slagging other people, but I see despondent. I see dogs dysfunction. I see dogs suffering in fear and, and pain and trauma. And I see the humans, the family, the parents who are doing whatever they can to stabilize. And they're spending money that they shouldn't have to spend needlessly. I see that injustice. I spent four plus hours with a couple last night at a reduced rate on top of that because it was with a rescue. And I knew it was going to take me more than two hours because there was a lot of stuff to correct that was improperly trained by the two trainers. The treat training part of it had to be just dissipated, gone. Don't bring any treats. They even had stuff on, you know, just, anyways, it was no more. And then the alpha part was even more convoluted because the dog learns in its predacious nature how to overcome previous aspects of training from different trainers. Your dog adapts. He learns. She knows what you're doing. If I make a shift in my behavior, Zevia looks for both the changes in my behavior, the changes in my training method, the changes in my conversation, the changes in my conduct, my everything. Our dogs are processing everything at one-tenth of a second. They know what's going on. They can't be lured, L-U-R-E-D. They're not being lured like erroneously stated by a lot of known trainers like Learberg. They can't, they're not being lured. They're actually anticipating and seeing and analyzing our behavior at one-tenth of a second. It's impossible to lure a dog when you have them on a leash. It's impossible to lure a dog when you're training them. The dog's paying attention to the stimulus that we're presenting to them. The only way you lure a dog or any animal is you lay a trap and the dog gets lured by the food. It's this, this, this craziness. This, this, I got to sit up here, Sammy. Hi, Sammy. It's, it's all the stuff that just doesn't make any sense. And so I have to fix, not fix, I have to address the alpha side of things because Tony doesn't trust his family, Tony doesn't trust me. So then it's getting back and getting him stabilized. So uh, we, we took him out for a walk and we went around and we got him around to be able to not bark at every single car anymore. And he would bark and then he would turn on his human and he'd start nipping at his humans, at his parents. And he did that to me as well. He'd turn on me and he'd nip at me and all that stuff. And, you know, it, it, it doesn't, it's not ticklish. It hurts. But of course, we don't want to, you know, anyways. 
he 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 was really upset. And then when we actually got ourselves his his mom, we were able to walk him on the outskirts of an off leash park. And he, he was not too bad considering everything that happened beforehand, considering how he was reactive to other dogs. And in actual fact, another from Molson came running up and you could see, and I could see in Tony's behavior where he was just like, ah, I'm supposed to react and I don't know what to do. And he kind of went all over a bit and he, he lost it a little bit, but he was able to be brought back under control and parenting by his mom and me in seconds. And it seems like it takes forever, right? Because when we have a reactive dog, we're like, oh my gosh, this is taking forever because my dog's freaking out and barking and, and all that. But in actual fact, it was less than a minute. Our time stands still when we're anxious, right? Because we're experiencing, we're processing things that are going on at a very fast pace, almost like an animal, which is what we are. We are predators. We are Borg, so we're predators. Um, so we're able to do that, able to walk them past. And of course, um, you know, people are say, oh, well, what about trigger stacking and all that stuff? It's ridiculous. Trigger, oh my gosh. It just means that, these people who have said these terms are frustrated and don't know how to interpret and don't understand dog behavior. We can see dogs in shelters. We can see dogs uh, guarding property. You walk by, remember, you walk by a, a property with a fence and a dog's running loose and he's guarding the property. That dog will bark at that fence while we walk by. And if we stand at the fence for half an hour, the dog will bark at us for half an hour. That's trigger stacking, right? See? It's not. It's just the way the dog's able to sustain their behavior. And to begin with, the dogs are already, already reactive. They're already consequential. They're already behaving in a dysfunction, they're ready at that level. So how do we help them? How do we help our dogs that are upset and, and dysfunctional? We don't alpha them. We don't alpha a dog. If someone's upset, if your child's upset and angry, you don't start forcing your child onto the ground. Same thing with a hot stove. You sit down with your child and you talk to them. And you try to reason with them. It's harder with dogs because they're at one-tenth of a second reaction time. It's harder with dogs because they nip. And it's harder with dogs because they'll bite. I mean, I was afraid of getting bitten in the face yesterday pretty well every single time. I knew I was getting nipped and, and, and nipped on the arm and the leg and stuff like that. But whatever. That's not a big deal. But getting bitten in the face is one that's always a fear of mine because I could lose an eye. Or worse. Um, more disfigurement than that. But if I approached Tony in a dominant behavior, in an alpha aspect of, hey, I'm going to make you do what I want so you're not reactive anymore, we would have gotten nowhere yesterday. We would have gotten absolutely nowhere. In fact, Tony would have reacted even more so and he would have been vicious with me more than anything else because he would have learned to distrust me and only fear me by being dominant by force and compliance by physical aspects but why would i want to why would any of us need to do that it's not necessary i mean mary hey K oh hey casey mary writes i've seen the same with people putting dogs in cages uh, before I go on to what Mary wrote down, I've seen people put dogs in cages. So we talk about putting dogs in kennel. And if you have to, you got to put the dog in your kennel. That's okay. Take the collar off. Take the collar off because your dog can, and it has happened, can get the collar caught on a wire by accident, twist and choke and suffocate. And it is a horrific death that lasts three minutes as the dog, your dog, suffocates to death fearful it's horrible i drowned as a kid i know the feeling of not having breath it's it's absolutely horrific and traumatizing i can go back into a swimming pool for uh eight years and i drowned in a swimming pool 
and I had to be resuscitated. I was in the adult pool when I got transferred over because I was advanced in my little kid pool. But uh, yeah, so I remember I went under, couldn't breathe anymore, could feel water and chlorine in my lungs and my th- and my nose. And um, and then that was it. I was done. And I woke up being resuscitated on the deck of the uh, of the thing uh, of the of the swimming pool. And um, yeah, I had trouble even taking a shower. Once the water hit my face, I, I was I would panic, and I was like, I think I was like, it happened to me when I was six. So probably when I was like seven, eight years old, it started happening where I was traumatized. I couldn't put my hand head under water. Uh, I couldn't even go to a swimming pool. Even we would go. My friends would take me to the kid pool because they knew I drowned, and they would try to get me to learn how to swim. And I would try to be in the kid pool and just kind of kneel down, like I'm a little kid. I'm kneeling down in the water, and I was okay. I got off to my throat, and I could feel the the the, the water pressure. And then when I had my head underwater, completely panicked and, and fear and that trauma will last forever. Your dog is going to feel trauma forever. And they may not be able to visualize it and process it in a cognizant manner. They still feel it. They still feel every trauma. They still feel the aspects of fear, the being disrespected of being forced to comply. And so the alpha part of things is just an archaic part that doesn't need to happen. Um, when it comes to the kennel, sorry, let me just pull this back down. Uh, when it comes to the kennel part of it, people always say, you know, my dog does great. Once they're in the kennel, they're cool. They settle down. They're right. And, and a lot of dogs are good like that. And the only reason I say that is because it's kind of like, you know, and for those of you who kennel your dog and I know you have to, right. I, I, I have, uh, one large dog here that I don't, I like, I don't put, I mean, I have kennels that will fit great Danes, but I won't put them in, um, in it just because I don't ride ever. And I'll come home. Maybe there'll be pee on the floor or poo on the floor or some stuff ripped up. So I put them in my bedroom, which is a large kennel. Right. And I practice that by being at home. And I'll talk about it another day. Once I start getting my podcast equipment, finally, by the beginning of December, then I figure out how to do it. Then I'll start making things a bit more um, um, cleaner. But um, I'll put them in the in the bedroom. And, you know, hope and pray uh, one of them doesn't pee on the bed. And they peed right through to the mattress. And I've gotten upset. I'm like, and I start yelling. I'm like, ah, why are you guys? Who peed on the bed? And I'll get pissed off, right? I'll have to clean all the laundry. And now it's like, yeah, okay. I'm just going to clean the bed because he's either that or else they tear up the rest of the house. But um, the thing is when a dog goes in the kennel, most dogs understand that there's no escape. It's just like someone going to prison. Once you're in the jail, you're not going to be able to escape. So, or solitary confinement, whatever. Um, let's see what did Mary said. I, I bought a, I brought a dog home and put her in the cage. She went nuts and messed in the cage. I took her out and she turned out to be a great dog. She thought uh, she thought I was going to neglect her. Yeah, I mean, it can be that part on um, the abandonment issues, Mary. It depends on what, if the dog has been in there and been abused, um, socialization, all that stuff. But yeah, they, you know, it's not natural for a human to be in a prison. It's not natural for a dog to be in a cage. And uh, so it's a, it's a hor- horrible fine line to, to pull through. Uh, Casey, hi, Casey. All right. And have, uh, Kathleen says, each of my shepherds have their own kennels. They have since they were young puppies. This helped when they could not be watched and kept them safe. Now the doors are really closed. The dogs can be, uh, the dogs, oh, where is it? The dogs can be found going there themselves. I've made them nice and cozy. Kennels used correctly for a limited time is not bad. Yeah, and I, and I agree, right? I mean, it's totally cool. It's just to have there, you have some bedding in there. They get to hang out. They have their own safe place. It's their own bedroom, so to speak. Um, I'm not, not coming down on it. It's just that's, that's where I'm at. Um, and it's tough, too, because you don't want to come home and find out that your dog's eating stuff, right? I remember reading a post where there was a guy... <sighs> Uh, uh, and this is locally too, where a guy bought a loaf of raisin bread and left it on the counter. And when his dog, he left and came home and his dog had eaten the raisin bread, raisin bread. And then, and then his dog subsequently died of, uh, of, uh, failure. Um, I can't remember what it was, but grapes and raisins are poisonous to dogs. Grapes 
and raisins. Doesn't matter if they're dried raisins, doesn't matter if they're fresh grapes, whatever, they are poisonous to dogs and they will kill them. So I remember that guy had written down that he wasn't thinking about it. So it's a hard, it's a hard call. I mean, I have a different luxury though, is the fact that I, so, so to speak, work from home. So that allows me um, to, to basically, you know, have a bit more safeguarding on what's going on and I can work with my dogs a bit more in a free range situation. Sometimes I use an X pen, which is an eight sided, uh, you know, collapsible uh, kennel. Well, it's basically like, you know, like a eight sided fence um, enclosure. I mean, where you see it at, at uh, shows, dog shows and all that stuff and the dog runs around it. So sometimes I'll use that in the sense of using it as a gate or a barrier to remove access to the kitchen. Because uh, one of them really likes to eat garbage too as well. I mean, and I understand, right? So, so you know, the bedroom is like a kennel for my dogs. And every once in a while, they go in on their own. And a lot of times, they like to hang out with me or, or near me. But they'll go off on their own and they'll hang out and sleep in there by themselves on the bed, two or three at, at once. Um, and Mercy, I'm saying this guy must have made her live in there all the time. Oh, yeah, that's probably true. Um, Kelsey. To remind or loosen the home 80%. Yeah, I mean, that's the, like, it's it's nice to let the dogs run free, right? It's just to do so. Sammy, I have to put you down, okay? See how she looked at me? She heard me talking to her. I always use conversation with my dogs. Always. I'm going to see if I can bring you over this way, Sam. What do we call Sammy? Hi, Sammy. And there's a, there's a certain way to carry a dog that has only two legs and stuff. Uh, to make sure that I don't care, but I'm gonna put Sammy down. Sammy, say bye. Sammy. Sammy. Sammy's embarrassed. Sammy doesn't want to talk. She says she doesn't have a good talking voice. Hi, Sammy. Thanks. Thanks for bearing with me on that. Uh, on that little little part there. Um, yeah. So, uh, so anyhow, with with the alpha side of things, is you just want to make sure that if you're working with a skilled trainer that they're not going to alpha the dog. And you want to find out whether, uh, what their opinion is on alpha. Definitely want to, want to hear that. And then you want to watch their behavior as well for alpha. Um, another thing I, I want to say too, is someone had uh, contacted me and they had gone through uh, another trainer, well-known trainer, an expensive trainer. They, they, they said they spent over $1,200 for the same issue. I don't understand why it would take someone uh, uh, $1,200 to do something that takes one session to deal with. Yes, okay, so I have a rare gift with dogs. I'm reading them at two tenths of a second. I have 100% accuracy. I'm working with extremely dangerous predatorial dogs. I've never turned down a dog and I have been 100% successful with my evaluation. So yes, I have a rare gift with dogs. I can connect with them. I can read them. I can tell you why they blink. I can tell you how they, I've talked already about why dogs paw at us because it's a codependent behavior. I've talked about the fact that we need to use our intuition with our dogs, uh, how dogs process memory, I'm uh, sorry, how dogs process time, how dogs process pain, how dogs tail behavior works and all that. But when it comes to just addressing the dog's issues, you don't need a lot of talent. You just need your intuition. I mean, there's a lot of people out there who, you know, I'm really thankful I get people watching my vlog now, three, 400 views, uh, which is really flattering. <laughs> Amazing, actually. Um, just really uh, very kind of you people. Um, but... You, Hi, Sammy. Sammy wants to come back again. But you see, there's there's people who've had their dogs, and you read their posts in Facebook, and they're not doing the alpha thing. They're not doing any shock collar or anything like that. But they've spent, they'll say, you know, when, when I first got, uh, you know, Susan, she was really hard and reactive and dangerous and all of that stuff. But two years later, we've got some really good improvements. She's still not there yet, but we spent two years with her working on our own with our dog and all that, right? And it's intuition. You wouldn't be able to achieve the milestone movement ahead two years later unless you knew what you're doing, unless you were connecting. And I think pretty well everybody out there will say, well, if I was alpha to my dog, my skittish dog, it would not have helped. 
right? It makes sense. It makes sense. So what I wrote down in my description here is understanding that alpha muzzling a skittish dog is highly traumatizing, demonstrates lack of experience with dog behavior. That's the professionals, right? I mean, for people who own dogs and have adopted dogs, totally fine, like I say, to do what you feel is right if you're getting results. If you're getting a dog that is fearful or or, or pensive around you or somewhat uh, um, erratic in behavior because it's a self-doubt issue and it's a low self-esteem and it's an insecurity issue, then those are other aspects to look for. But you want to improve that. But as a professional, it's something that should just go away forever, alpha. It's just inexperience and it's just it's it's brutality and it's arrogance um brute forcing compliance is a reflection of inexperience guessing that guessing that using power to overcome a dog is intimidation by the professional right so it's, so what i mean by that brute forcing compliance is a reflection of inexperience it's the fact that the 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 professional is just guessing well i don't know what's wrong so i'm just going to use force i'm guessing i'm speculating i'm hoping that it's going to work out I mean, let's face it, when we were bullied in school, right? I was bullied. When we were bullied in school, what happens? You get afraid of these people, right? You become afraid. You comply because you're afraid. You avoid areas that these people will be in because you're afraid you're going to get hurt. It's alpha. I mean, I don't know how many people fall in love with someone who's alpha uh, oppressive in that sense of it. There's another, you know, we've got the yin and yang type of relationships and all that, but our dogs are willing to give their life to defend ours. Our dogs are children around us. They really are. They act like that. You know, they roll over. They, they let us pet them. Alpha's really not, alpha's not modern. Alpha's old. Alpha's what cheap people do. <laughs> that's like, that's like silly. Uh, I say here, it's archaic. If we, Consider our beloved dogs like our own children. They would sacrifice their life to defend, to defend ours. Yet to have someone physically oppress and suppress your dog as a training exercise is sick. And that's what I write down, right? And, and again, I'm just, it's just there's no need. Try a different way uh, as a professional. Try a different way. Try to trust your intuition. You know, there's, there's, to be able to go so forceful on a dog, I mean, really, what kind of person can you be in real life if you got to be like that? If you see such a difference between a human and a, and a dog, oh, I would never do that to a dog. Uh, I mean, I would never do that to a human. Oh, only dogs, alpha. It's like, really? Really? Are you that insecure about yourself? You can't trust your own intuition? You're that insecure about yourself? You can't trust yourself with a dog? So what if a dog bites you? Who cares? I've been bitten <laughs> lots of times. I've been bitten everywhere. I've been, I got bitten back of the leg, uh, an inch by inch bite. It was, it was brutal. And this is by a couple that spent over $10,000 on different trainers all across Canada. It took like, it took, well, two and a half sessions, but it was an older dog. But the, the alpha part is never going to work. The skill of a professional is giving you both a detailed root psychological understanding of your dog and being able to develop real-time training. And that's truly who you want to find. That's truly who you want to hire. It's somebody who can go in, look at your dog and say, that's the issue with your dog. You look at the behavior, look at the way your dog's eyes are blinking, look at the way your dog is licking their mouth left, right, or center. Look at the way your dog is holding their paws and their body position. All that part that we see, that we look at somebody else on the street and we can look at someone standing somewhere and can give an opinion about that person who's standing, saying, oh, well, look at the, you can tell that they have a limp or you can tell that they're not happy or that they walked out with their shoulders. All these things we can tell by looking at somebody else. We can do that with our dogs. And we want the professional who is experienced with hundreds, if not thousands of dogs. My experience isn't thousands of dogs. My experience is over 1,400 days alone with extremely dangerous predatory dogs that are 150 plus pounds, right? It's in the newspaper. You can contact the Southampton Animal Shelter, the Court of New York, Save Rocky, the Great Dane Rescue and Rehab Charity, largest Great Dane Rescue in North America. 
New Hope for Danes, the oldest Great Dane Rescue in North America. You can Google BC Dog Whisperer. You'll see the articles in the newspaper about me, front page and everything. No alpha at any time. There's no need for any of that stuff. There's, I just go in and I look at, uh, like Tony, I, I already knew by looking at his photos, right? You go to my website, arfarfbarkbark.com, under the tab where it says, help for your dog. I give free help. You just join my Facebook group. You put a post up with a, a detailed, concise, paragraphical descriptions of your dog's behavior and history and issues. You put photos, clear photos of your dog's eyes, face, and body. And I read it. You read, look at the tab. It's 100% accurate. People are like, holy cow. And it's not Great Danes only. It's all breeds. And I said to the couple yesterday too, for example, why do I look at photos of your dog? Why do I need photos of your dog? It's the same thing when you guys out there, all right, my viewers, my followers, my, uh, my supporters, when you go and adopt a dog, what did you do? You looked at 100 photos, 200 pictures of different dogs. And then you fell in love with one. Well, you fell in love with 20, right? But you, you had to decide on one. And you fell in love with that one dog. Why? Out of 200 plus photos, you looked at that one dog that you decided to apply to adopt because you were in love. You felt an emotional connection. That's what I feel with your dogs. And I do it. And, and the, the connection that you have emotionally, I fall in love deeper with your dog than you'll ever understand because only through true love that incredible sentient connection that we have with another amazing being only through true love can we heal someone else another dog another human only through our true love the purity and the sincerity of our soul is to help another animal to help another human being good samaritan but you fell in love i fall in love that photo of your dog and then when I get to meet your dog, I look at the issues and the behavior and their mannerisms, and it's working at a tenth of a second how fast these guys are, these dogs are doing. And then we just apply patience and watch what's going on and see how our dogs are behaving and see what's happening to this stimulus or that stimulus and then understanding. So I've got over 1,400 days alone with you guys, over 20,000 hours. The most dangerous dogs, these are dogs that have stalked me in my own home, that they come up to my chest, and I'm 5 feet 11 inches. They come up to my chest on standing on just on all fours. They're not on hind legs. They're just standing. They're that giant. And they've trapped me in my home. They've cornered me, like literally cornered me. And they're not the typical kind of dogs that you see that go and attack you right off the bat. They're predatorial, and that's the difference. And I've had them all. There's no alpha going on. For me to understand what's wrong with their, your dog or, or the dogs that come into my home is understanding why they hurt. And sometimes we don't know the full history and almost never actually we, we know the full history, but we wanna understand what's wrong. And for those of you who have worked with your dogs by yourself at home without alpha or, or trying whatever you could and getting success, that's what I do with, with your dog. I just do it obviously quite, quite fast but i do with your dog i fall I, I do exactly what you do so you can do the same things let's start trusting your intuition don't trust alpha don't trust dominance don't trust anger i used to be an angry guy when i was younger because i didn't know what i was doing i didn't know what i wanted to do in my life when i grew up the frustration the anxiety uh, feeling myself of an ineptitude of failure Looking at our dogs, looking at your, looking at a dog and just going, wow, there's, there's a reason why they hurt. So if I try this, if I try this little and my dog doesn't react, then okay, then maybe that's an inroad of trust, but I don't want to push it. I don't want to alpha. I don't want to force myself in. I'm just going to, okay, that's cool. I'm going to just, I'm going to take that. I mean, there's, there's so many times when Walter, you know, he's a dog that 180, 183 pounds, 183 pounds, 38 inches at the withers. His, his shoulders come up to my hips. I'm five foot 11. His shoulder comes up to my hips. Attacked 16 people, right? Dragged a shelter worker into his kennel, 
a bit of child in the face around his food. He was, re- you know, all these things I talk about. Alpha would never have worked with with Walter. Alpha would never have worked with with uh, with Nero. Alpha would never have worked with Minky. And that's him running around in the background. Hi, Minky. Alpha would never have worked with any of them. Hi, Minky. Come on. Come, silly boy. Come, Minky. Here, Minky's gonna do it. Guest parents, guys. Hi, Minky. Hello. Hello, Minky. Hello, Minky. Right? And even getting my face to a dog like Minky, which is kind of like Tony, but worse because Minky would bite people without warning. And he'd been choked as well. He'd been choked with on the meat dog farm in Korea. All this distrust is happening. Alpha would never have worked. So I'm just saying it doesn't work to truly heal your dog. When we fall in love with somebody, right? And that's my quest is to fall in love with somebody, to find true love with her, right? I mean, to find someone absolutely, to, my heart just goes, wow, I would do anything for you. Like even if you need a kidney, that's true love. To do that with our dogs is right there. We just, just approach our dogs. But when you see your dog, and I talk about, you know, uh, the dogs, why dogs jump up on us, right? When they come home, right? There's that thing about how to stop dogs from jumping on us because it's a it's an anxiety, it's an abandonment issue, it's insecurity, it's low self esteem, it's codependency, it's interdependency, it's all these psychological dysfunctions that happen. Alpha doesn't work with these things. Demand more of your trainer, demand more of your behaviorists, especially the behaviorists that have their PhDs and masters like Dr. Ledger and Dr. Richter. Demand more. Don't just say, give me medication. No, don't just take their medication, such prescriptions and buy drugs, psycho, psychological, psycho, psychotic drugs for them. Why does my dog have fear, Dr. Ledger? What's the insecurity coming from, Dr. Richter? What does this medication serve to do? And if it serves to do a purpose, then how accurate is the dosage that you're going to be giving me the first time? And why do we have to fluctuate the dosage all the time if you already know what's wrong with my dog, unless you're shifting the dosage because you're guessing or you just don't know what's happening. You're just throwing a blanket on top of all the behavior and going, well, this is just a deal with it because it'll just mellow out the dog. Ask more of your behaviors. If you're paying $400 an hour, you should only take them one session and they should be able to correct and tell you what exactly is wrong with your dog 100%. My accuracy is 100%. I don't have a PhD. I work with dogs that will kill Dr. Ledger. I work with dogs that will kill Dr. Richter. I work with dogs that will kill 80 to 90% of the people that work with dogs. And it's not an embellishment and it's not a thrill of, of a life to, to put myself in danger. The fear is brutal. My friends who talk to me about what I do know how much stress I have in my life when it comes to working with these dogs in person. But I do it because I know what to do because I want to help them heal. I don't want to alpha them. I don't want to intimidate your dog, anyone's dog. I want to parent them. That's what you can do yourselves. You can parent your dog. Oh, Rita. Hi, Mickey. Um, Kim. And some dogs that won't kill people too. I mean, there's, yeah, there's dogs that won't kill people. There's dogs that will kill other dogs only, right, Kim? But I'm just saying, approach as if you would a parent to your dog. I know it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough thing. And I know it's not an easy concept to think about, oh my gosh, I got to connect with this dog doesn't even talk to me. I don't know. It's an animal, but I love him, <laughs> right? But we can do it. I mean, there's there's people out there, usually guys who don't want to do any PDA, any public displays of affection with their dog. There's one dog in, in one of my videos, and I won't name the person, but uh, a husband and wife with their dog who is dangerous, and he muzzle punches me in the face. And the husband wouldn't even give his dog a hug because he just didn't feel that that was necessary to give to a dog. I know, right? So then we work it all through, but it's explained to them 
that love will heal. That the only way I was able to progress their dog in 36 minutes was because I approached it from true love with their dog. I fell in love with their dog and I connected and I saw all their hurts and their, their pain and I helped them to heal. Couldn't dominate their dog. There's no way I could dominate a dog like that. He would, well, he already muzzle punched me. He would be even more vicious. He, he would hate me. So when you get, get to your dogs, parent them. Just like the way your parents would keep you away from the hot stove. Just the same way your parents would tell you to wear your seatbelt. You have to remind your dog in a loving, firm manner but you don't have to brutalize them. You don't have to hire someone who's going to brutalize them. Professionals out there, you know you can make the shift. Trust your intuition. We, we, I, I talk about the, what someone called intermediate bridging, which I had no idea and I had to Google it. But for those of you professionals out there, trust that your intermediate bridging is actually your intuition at work. It's what I do. It's, it's what happens. There's no need for alpha, and you can get away from alpha. Join up some of those dog training groups. Lots of people can, anyone can pretty well join up. Some these are like training groups are like 20,000, 80,000 members, right? And they're not dog trainers. It's just people. There's most, a lot of dog trainers in it and behaviors in it. And then there's a majority of just owners, families that have dogs. And you see the banality of what goes on. All these posts are like, well, you know, I've tried this and I've tried that and I've tried this and it's not working anymore. And people are like, have you tried that? And they're like, yeah, I've tried that too and it's not working. And they're like, we're out of our bag of tricks. There's no bag of tricks when it comes to dogs. There's no bag of tricks when it comes to humans. It's a devaluation that we have for life, right? It's a devaluation for, for everything if we're not looking to love and to have compassion and to care. The alpha thing would just be totally just, dis- oh my gosh, I would have been so killed. I would have been freaking had, I would have been ripped to pieces so many times. I would have been ripped so many times. You know, there's a one time where Nero, I triggered him on purpose and he, he was uh, 10 years, four months of age when I adopted him. A Great Dane that spent seven years caged and used for breeding. Then the last three years before he came to me in Alabama is where he lived. He was chained up outside with a prong collar for three long years in Alabama, winter and summer. He dragged from his foster place in Alabama before I found out about him. So it happened before me. He dragged a robust woman, about 250 pound woman off the couch onto the floor and inflicted 67 stitch wounds that required 67 stitches. These are all independently verified. He would attempt to grab human beings. He'd jump up on over the fence, uh, at the fence and grab people who put their arms too close and try to drag them up and over the fence. The panics, the, the, the stories, the, the franticness of Nero's behavior, brutal. You can't alpha a dog like that. He lived it and he was intact too because he was used for breeding. So he was intact when he came to me. He never tried to dominate me. Right? They talk about the dog, alpha male, alpha female, right? We talked about he never tried to dominate me. Walter never tried to dominate me. Minky never tried to dominate me. Lincoln never tried. None of the dogs have ever tried to dominate me. But they're predacious. And that's what you, people need to understand. It's not a dominant behavior. It's a predacious behavior, opportunistic, consequential. The alpha thing, we can shift that to a gentler part. For us who are not professionals, we can shift that to a gentler way of behavior. Learn to parent your dogs. Connect with them. Even with Sammy. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll say something. Right. When I said to Sam, I'm going to put you down. She just, she, she registered the tone, the conversation, right? I talk about conversational tone. She registered. You could see how her eyes blinked and she made eye contact with me. Alpha is what cave men do. Alpha is what 
people who don't know their own confidence and security in their in their life uh, professionally do right. These are these are people you're paying 150, 250, 400 dollars to brutalize your dog. You could do it yourself. Why don't you just brutalize your own dog? But we're paying these professionals to do so. These dudes who can't even afford to pay for air conditioning in their seventy thousand dollar SUV. What does that tell you? Whose comfort is more important? Theirs or your dog's? Why is alpha such a prevalent thing? Because it's the easiest. It's like a shock collar. For a professional to apply these things, for humans, families, you don't have time. You, you're trying to figure it out. You're frustrated. You don't have the wealth of experience. These guys, these professionals, my peers, my colleagues, they have the experience. You know, I, I was saying earlier is I've worked with hundreds of dogs. I haven't worked with thousands. I mean, it just, it's, it's such a ridiculous statement when I hear people say that, especially these dudes, when I look at their site and all stuff, you know, worked with thousands of dogs. You've worked with, okay, so you've worked with thousands of dogs, you dudes, and you still haven't learned anything? You got still alpha the dog, really? After thousands of dogs? I've worked with hundreds because working with dangerous dogs, working with aggressive, reactive, skittish, whatever, at the level that I work at, most of those dogs are killed already. Most of those dogs are, are, are killed often because the trainer or behaviorist has made silly statements that that's the worst dog I've ever worked with, et cetera, et cetera. I've worked with dogs that just heartbreaking where their histories come from, heartbreaking from the, the amount of abuse. You know, and it drives me nuts. I see these rescue orgs out there. There's one that brings in dogs from Formosa, uh, Formosa Mountain Dogs from Taiwan. And she uses a treat trainer. It's trying to get compliance through treat. Like it's just, you can't help dysfunctions by working with food. You can't help dysfunction by giving food. It's bribery. It, it's dis, disingenuous. It's counterintuitive. Food doesn't exist anywhere in the entire canine species. Here they come. Hi, Lincoln. There's Lincoln. Hi, Lincoln. And then the competition. That's Anthony. Anthony is up for adoption. 160 pounds. There he is. This is a dog that can't be put in a kennel. His rescue, one day at a time, couldn't be put in a kennel. And he would urinate everywhere and a whole bunch of stuff. Lincoln. Hi, Lincoln. We, we, we address the dysfunctions. You have a friend of yours phone you up and they have a bad day. You talk them off the ledge. You help them. Hi, Minky. And Minky's here too. Come, Minky. Hello, silly boy. Come on, Minky. There's Minky's big head. And these are all dog reactive dogs. These are dog reactive dogs. Minky's dog reactive. Lincoln is declared dangerous uh, by animal control um, in, in one of the cities here. Uh, you know, the, uh, the other dogs, they've attacked other dogs. And I'm not laughing as like making it disingenuous. I'm laughing because it's like, these are such simple issues to address. Really simple issues to address. If we remove all our little flash and show, we get rid of the shock collars. If we, if we, if we stop doing alpha, if we get rid of the treats. If we get rid of the treats... What, what then does that leave my colleagues to do? It leaves them the only choice but to concentrate and work with the dogs intuitively. Every single trainer and behaviorist that has humility has the ability to pull in from their intuition. I have the benefit of never having taken any training courses, classes, anything like that at all. Just by fate, 
And you can ask Elaine Dixon, founder of the oldest Great Dane Rescue in Canada, New Hope for Danes, established in 1984 with over 5,000 Great Danes and mixes saved. She's the one who knows me from day one. She's the one who told me to get into this. So with no experience whatsoever, I had no choice. I adopted a Great Dane that was... He killed a baby squirrel. He, he would lunge at people walking across the street. It's 154 pounds. He would do all these things. I had no choice but to learn. And I tried all the treats and I tried all the other stuff. And he came with a choke chain, a slip collar on him. All these things I didn't know. I had no idea what to do. Then I finally went, you know what? Why don't I just connect to Lincoln? This is not this Lincoln, my first Lincoln. Why, why not just connect to Lincoln and help him? And just talk to him. And that's what I did. I parented Lincoln. And yeah, I was told to do alpha. I was told to do the treats. I was told all that. Go get a shock collar. I was told all these things. I was told, get a prong collar. But then none of it made sense. And when I would talk to Elaine Dixon, I would say, this doesn't make sense. Why should I do I talked to I talked to I talked to CKC breeders. I talked to Anthony. No. Anthony's going through the garbage now. No, these are. Uh, I've I've talked to CKC breeders. I've talked to champion, right, grand champion breeders, about Danes, and they all said this and that. And I'm like, none of it would work. I tried it all. It didn't work. I went, okay, you know what? I'm gonna just parent my dog. I'm gonna emotionally connect with them. Anyhow, I'm gonna end this off. I'm uh, an hour and twenty six minutes. Um, started late, having camera problems hopefully uh, i am going to get i'm going to return this one amazon's horrible customer service oh my gosh this jeff basil guy <sighs> horrible camera packed no no padding in plastic and the camera lens open just just brutal and they don't they, they don't care oh just like wow so anyways, I'm going to end up buying another, uh, I'm going to buy a different camera, uh, a little bit more expensive, I have to, but might as well do what I need to do. So um, hopefully we're going to fix up this stuff. If you have any questions, you're welcome, uh, Jody. Uh, Jody says, they are all so precious, James. Thank you so much for helping them and all the other fur babies. Uh, Jody's really a great person. Um, Jody has been involved with the, um, with advocating um, to stop, and end the meat dog uh, trade in Asia. I, you know, um, and so there's actually, uh, yeah, there's a there's a a podcast series going on called Stop Yulin, and I was fortunate. Um, uh, Jade Era, um, she does. She's doing the podcast, and she's already interviewed um, John Daly from Soy Dogs. Um, uh, the producer and director of Dog War, which is another um, film. This is an um, Emmy Award winning director who, who did that one. She's interviewed him. She just completed an interview with John Sessa, uh, executive director of Vanderpump Dogs. I think she will be uh, having an interview with um, one of the people at Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation. I'm not sure who. Uh, uh, a few other uh, very well-known organizations. I think she's trying to get in touch with HSI as well, Humane Society International. I want to say that I'm quite uh, fortunate uh, and honored to be one of the people that she interviewed as well. And um, that would be coming out in a podcast soon. And, I, I, you know, and Jody, you know all the stuff that's going on. So um, it's been a lot of advocacy throughout the world, all the stuff. Anyhow, so. Um, I want to thank everybody for, uh, for spending the time. I'm finished off here with my vlog as I kind of always go back and forth. And uh, if you like my, my words, my vlog, my theories, my ideas, please like my page. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm now up to 492 subscribers. And so I'm almost halfway there to my vaulted 1,000 subscribers I would love to achieve. And, you know, it might take me six months or a year. Uh, but I'm I'm happy that uh, y'all are following me, and um, just means that you understand what I'm talking about. But for those of you who are subscribing to my YouTube channel and liking my page, you understand what I'm talking about, or you have an interest in what I'm talking about, and you think of this novel approach at what I'm doing, and how does this guy, me, how do I do this with every single dog, no matter how dangerous? 
it's really intuitive. It's really just setting forth and connecting just like you would with someone you love. True love. Find it. Keep it. Don't ever undervalue true love. Have a great night, everybody.